Lord Jesus, we are, uh, uh, we thank you. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for uh, willing hearts, God, to be drawn um, to your presence tonight in this place. Um, these are brothers and sisters. We just pray that you um, might meet us with uh, your gracious mercy, that you might reveal even more to us who you are, um, showing us all over again whose we are, yes. and also how we became yours, um, your peculiar possession, called out, drawn out of blindness, darkness, death, damnation, rebellion, um, and gracious place to the kingdom of your distant. Um, Father, what a journey, what a, what a transformation, what um, a change has overcome us. And Father, may we uh, spend the rest of our very lives trying to uh, more and more understand what you have done for us in Christ, what the Spirit has done by revealing and drawing us to Him. And may we tonight, um, as we look into your word, may our hearts be ravished um, with a sense of thanksgiving. Um, for we recognize concerning our salvation that this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And so, Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray for those who yet may be on their way. Uh, give them travel and mercies, hearts and tune, wherever we may be in the study. Um, and we thank you, Father, for your spirit, which will be present with us, teaching us. For no man or woman can actually uh, teach your people. It is you by your spirit. And so we need you. Come, Holy Spirit, uh, and manifest your great work here among us. Um, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Let's, um, let's open with a scripture, and I want to read something. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. The heart is of the Lord. People have had their hearts broken before in different circumstances and relationships. People, I saw the Lord pieces in their hearts. Psalm 92. If somebody wouldn't mind, uh, just grab verse number one for us, please. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. Amen. Uh, let another person read that as well. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise to your name, O Most High. Amen. I, I think that was the word I was looking for. Knowing that next week is Thanksgiving, um, we won't have a time of gathered. Um, Worship together and study next week. We'll be off. Let folks enjoy their families and the Thanksgiving time. But I wanted to center our time together tonight, starting off with that, because I believe what we've been dealing with in this conversation about let grace be grace, bless you, brother, um, is this reality of how we should be faithful. We started off a while back talking about Jeremiah 31 3, that God said to us that I have loved you. What an everlasting love. That love is specific. That love is settled. That love is certain. And that love reached from, listen to this, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting meaning. And this thing about the essence of God. Before there was creation, there was God. Think about this. Like before sun, moon, stars, people, animals, any of that, God was there in his triune essence all by himself. And think about this. He was happy. He was not incomplete. He was not desperate for something. Like God was settled and satisfied, full of joy, all by himself. I remember a young lady asked me one time after, uh, I forgot where I was preaching at. She asked me, she said, uh, where did God come from? I'm like, that's a great question. And I think that is the beauty of who we're talking about. God always is. Listen, he has, he has been, he is right now, and he will forever be. Listen, he had no beginning. Everything started. Like here is God who is self-existent, self-sufficient. Like, like I, don't, I, don't, I don't derive part of my being from something else. Like, I am complete all by myself before anything was. Listen to this. I don't need things. Things need me. Mm -hmm. 
Because listen to this. The Bible tells us about Christ that the whole universe, this world, is being held together by the word of his power. Like right now, sun still doing what it's supposed to do, moon, stars, because he said so. And it will change once he changed his conversation about it. But until then, I don't care what the scientists say, I don't care what the fears are, I don't care what alignments they see, none of that has final say so. But the God who, listen to this, always was and held, listen to this, he held the universe, galaxies, time, and space in his self before anything was. Now when you start talking about that God thought about me, and loved me specifically, you talking about something serious now. Mm -hmm. That God didn't need me. I wasn't nothing but a blip on the scale. Like, but that God held me in his heart with love for me, knowing what I would be and how I would live out my life. He loved me without any strings attached back then. And that love back then is already consummated in glory with a love that's telling me keep on coming. This set like, I ain't changed my mind, I just saw that too. But I ain't changed my mind about you. I know you're still struggling, get back up, keep coming towards me. That love loves me from beginning through the middle to the end. And so the Bible just told us, <clears throat> it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Just think about this. <clears throat> Part of why we're doing this digging is because, have you ever had somebody... Just come up to you and say, thank you. And you're kind of like, for what? <laughs> like, and so I believe our approach to God with the thank yous we will give, which will be like, I won't have enough thank yous. My lips, my tongue can't move fast enough to give enough thank yous for what he has done. But I don't want to go to him with a thank you. And I'm not really sure. He's not really sure. I want him to know that I know <laughs> that you, I know what you've done. And you didn't have to do, listen to this, not one piece of what you've done for me. So it is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord because it tells us we recognize that we don't deserve nothing. But he did it anyway. And so we want to begin this journey tonight um, wrestling with several things. So let me read something for us right away. John Piper, in this book called The Roots of Endurance, writes this phrase. And um, I think this is, uh, this is key. He says about perseverance. What is perseverance, first of all? Perseverance. Press through something to continually. Ability to keep pressing through something continually without stopping. To overcome. to overcome. Ability to overcome some stuff. Keep on going. Anybody else? Perseverance. How would you define perseverance? To be determined. To be determined. My mind is made up. I'm fixed in this position with this attitude, with this posture. Now think about what he says about that that we just described. He said perseverance is a gift. Perseverance does not originate within us as if we are so strong that we bring this ability to overcome, this ability to keep on going without stopping, this ability to keep pressing on. Like we don't develop that per se like within our own strength. He said perseverance is a gift that rises up in us. Listen to this, when sometimes I actually want to just be weak right now. I don't even feel like fighting through this no more. But for whatever reason, something else can kick in and I got a feeling that's rising towards what I should do and it ain't even messing with how I actually feel right now. It is overcoming, listen to this, not just the thing on the outside. It's overcoming who I am on the inside. See, this is why the blessing of God and his triune essence is key. I needed God in that creatorial work before time began deciding some things about me. I needed Christ in time to come live perfectly, die the death that I deserve to make me right with the Father. And then I need the activity of the Holy Spirit to call me out of blindness and darkness, make me alive, and then the Holy Spirit to keep working in me, to give me, listen to this, 
I don't know if you've ever, um, well, I use it this way. Uh, I've been on some, um, like, workouts or uh, so-called diets <laughs> that I've started with a lot of pizzazz. <laughs> Excitement, told everybody, like, hey, three weeks, a month later, I ain't forgot all about that. So what happened is I tried to accomplish something, though there were some impeding factors that began feelings. I want pie again. I want, I want cake right now. I don't want to work out today. I don't want to. So those things within me were stronger than this attitude or posture I had tried to take. And it whooped the diet workout right on out. It put me back where I am. Listen to this. I would rather be. But what God does by his spirit is, though I would by myself innately want to just rest, take it easy, get comfort, live for me, myself, and I, the spirit comes and begins to work against, listen to this, this is why, this is why he has to come so strongly. He works against my will, and then he makes me willing. The Bible says he works in us to will, and to do of his good pleasure. So I need the spirit to be active. Because if he leaves me to me, it ain't going to take too long. So I drift right on back into what I am all about. But for me to be about what he is all about, he can't just leave it with I created, I called, I chose an eternity past. I said Christ, live, die, rise on your behalf. I go get it. If he if it rests on me, listen, he ain't going to ever see me make it to the finish line. He's going to be always having to look for me. Where is he at? But he said, no, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come in you, work in you, and keep drawing you towards myself. And so perseverance is actually a gift. And listen to what he said. <clears throat> He said that I will wake up and be a believer tomorrow morning is not finally and decisively owing to my will, but to God. I have known too many mornings on the precipice to think otherwise, that I have been snatched back every time is sheer mercy. The human will cannot be depended on because in the, cri in the crisis of faith, it is precisely the will that is weak and falling. The question is, who will seize it and bring it back to God in faith? More and more, I love the candor and truth of the old hymn by Robert Robinson that says these words, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Mm -hmm. And he asks this question. Do you pray like that? Mm -hmm. Do you pray as if you are in desperate need mm -hmm. of him to keep you? Mm -hmm. For him to not let you go. Not pray necessarily as if, you know, it's kind of this 50-50 thing going on. You know, the Teddy Pendergrass says, no, this is 100%. I need God to work in me. A willingness, listen to this, and not even to do the right things, right? Like, not even to just get up and pray, read, my, not the mechanics, but to get up with a hunger and to get up with revelation that when I do open the word, I see something. And what I see thrills my heart and sets me and gets me in motion like, I need you. Or else I'll wake up, go through the mechanics, read it, and won't see nothing. Mm -hmm. I'll be on my coffee, I'll be reading it, thinking about traffic, and when I get to the sport, I got a meeting. But I need you to be active, opening my understanding, doing something, dilating my heart. So he says, do you pray like that? He said, this is my cry. Let your goodness, O oh God, bind my heart with a chain to you. Seal my will to yours with an unbreakable application of your eternal covenant. 
I, I, I almost like I wanted to fall off my chair when I read that. He said, listen to the language. He said, seal my will to yours. Seal it with what? He said, with an unbreakable application of your eternal covenant. See, that's what we've been dealing with. The gospel. Not a gospel that started in time when I walked down an aisle. Though I did walk down an aisle. But the reason why I walked down the aisle on that day was because way back here, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Listen, therefore, with love and kindness, did I draw you right here. I drew you here not because of anything you was doing or anything about you here. I drew you on this day because of what I decided back then. He said, when you can seal my will to your will with an unbreakable application or understanding of how settled you are, in your love for me, see that, that that creates willingness. Now remember what we've been talking about. <clears throat> Many people use the religious overturn up, overtones of, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But I don't think Jesus was saying it as many people say. You know how many people say, I thought you were saved. <laughs> you know, that, that, that angle like, I am saved. That's why I'm struck. Because <laughs> before I didn't struggle with this, I used to just do this and be cool with it. But now I'm struggling because there's another person on the inside challenging my will and my desires. But Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you'll obey me with the religious overtone. He said, and listen to this, I understand your brokenness and your weakness. What you need in order to want to do what I want you to do is you need to understand how much I love you. Because when you find out how much I love you, your love for me will be real. It's not going to be because you're trying to get me to do something. You will already know I've done and decided everything I'm going to do has already been decided. We ain't in no bargain. You ain't trying to work your way and earn my love. You are now stepping into the overflow of my saving activity. Already settled on you. Listen to this. You could not send your way out of the work of God to bring you out of damnation and sin. Like you couldn't have been so bad that God said, hold on, I changed my mind. He said, no, I already loved you and I knew my love would overcome that. And so when we can get brought to that place to understand how settled God is for us Amen. in his call, he said, listen to this, that changes the dynamics because we know the scripture that we love him because he first loved us. So I need to understand how much does he love me? What does that love look like? What is that love based on? Sometimes I think his love for me is based on how well I'm doing. And when I know I'm not doing good, I shrink from his presence. Because I think, you know, it's got conditions on it. But he said, what I need on them days when I wake up and I don't even feel like a Christian, I need something in the, by the Holy Spirit to register within me an unbreakable application of your eternal covenant, meaning your promise pledge, not eternal contract. See, contract is I do this, you do that. Covenant is one-sided by one person on behalf of somebody else. God says, I'm pledging, I'm promising this is how it's going to be because of what I've decided and this is going to be towards you in a saving way. I need that. I need an understanding of that because that's what challenges all of the idols that rise up in my heart, all of the, listen to this, competing loves that reside in me. You got them too. Oh, yes. Things that you want that you know he don't want you to want but you can't stop wanting I'll need you to do something, God, in me. It's perseverance. How am I going to overcome this? I need the Holy Ghost. So we need to be brought to this place. I'm going to finish reading this and we're going to go to some scriptures. He said, this is how Christians should pray. So what happens when you... 
Is it not that I'm not saying, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit? Because what if I'm like asking God, like, well, you know, I struggle with this, but I still fall short or still fall victim to it? Okay. Well, let me um, let me ask this. There's been um, there's been times I've lost something, specifically like money, right? And I wanted it so bad. I ain't stop. I ain't settle for it's all right. No, it ain't all right. I'm keep looking until that which has been lost is recovered. So I believe here is where he is praying, and I think here is where we need the Holy Spirit to kick in, because sometimes there's some radical stuff that need to be done, right? Mm -hmm. If I want some deliverance from something, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, maybe there's a time of me, I'm finna just get away from all the people I was hanging out with. I need to separate for a minute. Mm -hmm. I need to spend some time with the Lord, because mm -hmm. I'm asking him for more of him. Mm -hmm. But I'll just keep watching TV. You, he like, you don't really want me yet. So what God does, I believe many times is, and I said before, while we said it earlier in the packet, that's why God ain't afraid of our sin. He's not afraid of the real us. And many times he allows the real us to show up. And in the real us, you know the real us lead us into trouble. And drama. And tough spots. So then when we get in the tough spot, then, listen to he knows the tough spot will make real prayers happen. <laughs> the tough spot of a real desire happens. He's like, oh, now you want me. Amen. And so I believe God has a way. And that's why he's so settled, right? He's settled in his love. And his love is not because he like, the way most people talk about God is if you don't stop doing that, he going to leave you. But God said, no, I'm married to the backslide. Because you know what I decided back here? Amen. Before you was ever who you was. Amen. I was settled here, like I was in perfect peace over my choice of you here before I ever hung the sun and the moon. I was settled, and so I have patience for another reason. Because everything that needed to be accomplished for you has already been accomplished by Christ, and that's why I ain't panicking over your struggle right now. See, <clears throat> sanctification as well as, let me step back right here first. So, justification, remember what we're talking about, all three levels of salvation is by grace. Mm -hmm. Justification, I have called into what Christ has accomplished. Sanctification, which is the process of me becoming more like Christ, less by me, is not just because I'm trying hard enough. God is undertaking a process of elimination. Think about it. Um, one of the things that I witnessed God do in my own journey, especially the beginning journey, when most of my sinful stuff was out there, right? My sin was we women, pride, like it was stuff you could see. He wasn't dealing with the roots, the pride, the lust, the greed, the anger, stuff that you couldn't see even though I'm staring you in your face. He said, I ain't going to come after that later. Let me deal with the fruits. So the first thing he did was no more women. I was still smoking weed. I didn't have no problem with it. I was going to church, Bible study, trees, but he had no more of that. There was conviction about that, but I was still doing this. And then he said, all right. Coming after that. But I still had other stuff. So he said, listen, I am progressively. Think about this. In the book of Joshua, God promised the people the promised land. But he said, listen, I ain't giving it to you all at once. We're going to take it by stages. We're going to get this city, conquer it. All right? Go on up the road. We're going to take that city, conquer it. So that's where our salvation, that's why I'm saying God is not anxious over the real us. Because he knows he who has begun a good work will complete it even into the day of Christ Jesus. So he wants the process to happen because what he wants me to know is that all of my salvation is a gift. 
The overcoming power, that didn't rise because I wanted Christ so bad. Because I've seen too many times where I knew about Christ in my head, but right now I ain't thinking about that because I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's in my head, he up there, he in there, but I've got to do what I want to do right now. So I've seen too many moments with me right there. But the victory that overcame that wasn't me because I just showed my hand, I'm weak. I fall again. But God takes us through these momentums of seeing our weakness, being desperate for his strength, and then pleading with God. And listen to how he pleads with God. He said, keep me, preserve me, defeat every rising rebellion in me, overcome every nagging doubt, deliver me from every destructive temptation, nullify every fatal allurement, Expose every demonic deception, tear down every arrogant argument, shape me, incline me, hold me, listen to this word, master me. Master me. You see, this is what salvation is really about. Getting us off the throne and Christ being seated on the throne. And now the direction of my heart is motivated by him and not myself. So he says, listen, we have to engage with him in this warfare. We have to be, this is why we come to study. We, he talked to us now. And then he said, let me kindle a desire for those things that you're hearing right now. I said, God, I want that. Like, I remember I was in, a, in, in London on tour with the music, and I was in this kind of Though I was up there rapping, doing my thing, I was still in this kind of dry place. And uh, I remember seeing some cats with no title, no name. These dudes, I could tell, love the Lord. And even though I'm up here on front doing my thing, I was jealously, silently saying, I want that back. And I remember praying. At night in the hotel before, like, God, give me that back. Forget the rapping, the CDs, the traveling. Like, I just want to, I, like, I remember that love. And so there's moments when God awakens us to where he actually wants us. And then he begins to challenge us. Because remember I said before when we were in that hungry and thirsty for Christ, is that God don't need us, but he wants us. And he wants us to want him, thank you, sis. He wants us to want him like he wants us. See, it's not good, I guess, to be in love on a one-way street. Like, I love you, but you don't really love me. That's a hard, that make you feel some kind of way. But God says, listen, I am trying to kindle your level of love for me to be in the right response to my love for you. I want, I want this love to be in this place where we can just sit and look at each other. Yeah, yeah. We ain't got no money right now, yeah. but we, hey, love Ooh. is carrying us Thank through. You, I got stuff that I wish would happen and I'm praying and it ain't yeah. happening yet, but I'm so in love, I ain't tripping on what I don't got. Thank you, Lord. Because I'm in love mm. with who I do have. Yes, God. And so I just believe that God, that's why he has to help us understand his great love for us that didn't begin when I walked down the aisle, when I said yes to Jesus and I invited him into my heart. Oh my that his love was reaching after me. There's some stuff that I escaped yes. that I should have escaped yes. Yes. and I wasn't even yes. thinking about Jesus. But under, later on, I understood as I looked back down the path of my life, yeah, like, yeah. that was you. Yeah. That, like, I was dead wrong. Mm -hmm. But God was still working on my behalf mm -hmm. in spite of me because he loved me unconditionally. Because okay. remember, I keep going back to this. I have loved you yeah, yeah. with an everlasting love. And remember where we went with God. God always has been. Like he said, I've been loving you like God had no beginning. He didn't like, okay, I'm here now. Let me start being God. He like, I just always been here. Before sun, moon, stars. So my love for you has always and will always exist. And he's 
saying, if you can get a grasp of that, you'll love me too. Because especially when I can help open up for you what I have loved you out of. Where you wanted to go and where you was going to lead yourself. If I had, listen to this, overcome your will. Your stubbornness, your rebellion. That brother prayed and asked God, master me. I need you to be my savior and my Lord. I need you to run things. Listen to this, not just in the universe. Me. Hallelujah. And here. But see, God says, I want you to want that. Because he said, listen, there's a certain level that I don't want to force that because then it'll be too robotic. Mm -hmm. It'll happen and you won't understand the struggle, yeah. which means then you won't appreciate the process. And the place I got you to, but when you go through the struggle, and I bring you through the struggle, you'll know it wasn't because you were so strong. Because I was so strong. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so God has to, to work in a way to help us understand that I am settled on you, which is why I brought you to justification, which is I have made you right with me because of Christ. I'm going to skip sanctification. You will reach glorification. Remember John said, I see a number. No man can count. He said, I already see those you have loved with an everlasting love. I already see them in glory in your presence. He said, the reason you're going to reach that is because my love is settled. This in-between process of sanctification, which is to cause you to become, and I think become is less about actions, though it has a major emphasis on actions, meaning what you do. But I think the first part of sanctification and the main goal is God wants us to think about him the way Christ displayed for us as a human to think about God. Christ displayed total dependence upon God. He said, it's the Father in me. He doeth the works. Trouble up the road. It's nighttime. I got to get away and get into the presence of God. See, Jesus was, listen to this, human and divine. The divine aspect, we understand, he was God manifested in the flesh. But his humanity is key. One, so he could die on our behalf, live on our behalf, and die on our behalf. But his humanity was also to show us what the truth, because remember, Jesus is called the second Adam. The first Adam didn't live in full dependence upon God. Jesus came to put back in order what humanity looks like dependent upon God. Right. Which is why he says, I want to make you more Christ-like. Actions? Yeah, we're going to do something. But he says, attitude first. Because you know, actions come from attitude. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's how I'm thinking is what I'm doing. Right. Even though I might be talking one day, you just step back and say, let me watch you for a while. I know what you really mean. <laughs> So, so he wants to bring us to have this attitude of complete dependence. Great need, listen to this, not just salvation. I don't just need him to get to heaven, and I do. I need him to love my wife. I need him to lead my family. I need him to do my job without trying to get over on my job. I, I, like, I need him to like live right. To live in a way that honors him. I need him. Listen, I told you before, like I need God to help me love God. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> I like I need him for everything. Else he know 
before I can last. Because I told you I got some competing loves, and you do too. Mm -hmm. So I need him to have something that overcomes the just me of the game. I need him. And so, so, so let's look at a couple things. Uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy 7. So I know... Um, If you need one of these packets, um, raise your hand, but they want us to pass it out. Same as last year. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at that let grace be grace, the parachute jump. Um, this scripture that we're looking at first is not on there, but we'll get into what's on there in a second. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 through 10. Deuteronomy 7. Verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Help us, Lord Jesus. Remember what we started with. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Yes, Lord. And we really want to understand what are we giving him thanks for. Because the understanding of what we're actually thanking him for will hopefully help heighten the level uh, of thanksgiving and the way we give our thanksgiving to him. Because, you know, part of what he wants is, I don't just want thank yous with your lips. Mm -hmm. I want some thank yous with your life. Mm -hmm. I want your life to look like a thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I want your life to look like you saying thank you, Jesus. With how you live. Oh, I need your help, Jesus. So, look at Deuteronomy 7. Um, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. If somebody wouldn't mind beginning to read for us there, please. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering, you take possession of it, and here's the way many nations before you. The Hittites yep. and the Gasherites, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jezusites. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. Let's just stop for a second. So, so these ites <laughs> represent, <laughs> yeah, just say ites. <laughs> they, they represent, listen to this, they were naturally nations, peoples that were in possession of the land God promised. But in the spiritual dimension, these are, listen to this, these, these competing loves that are occupied, holding back the territory God wants to take for himself and let us enter into, right? He wants, God wants us to give us more, more holy space where we are able to enjoy him deeper. We're able to love him greater. Like he wants to expand, listen to this, our territory in gospel things. See, some of our joy in God, and I'll take it this way, is because of a lack of understanding about what God has done for us. He said, that's an ite. I got to conquer that ite and defeat that ite, get it out of the way, so you can take that space that that blockage is occupying. So he says, I got to do some stuff to bring you deeper and deeper and deeper into Christ. The Bible talks about, and we've said it before, the manifold wisdom of God. Which means there's so much more yes. to God than I could like. It's the manifold, multifolded. The layers are, they won't stop. There's, listen to this. <laughs> the, the, the heights, it's like, it ain't nothing, like, it, it keep going. Like, depths, like, width. Like, God is, there is so much of him, it's going to take, listen, all of eternity mm -hmm. to experience the fullness that he is. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like, so he says, listen, I am trying to bring you deeper into that. Because think about this. God is a foreign concept, mm -hmm. not only to our minds and our imaginations, but to our hearts. Like, we don't understand really like, okay, I know he saves me, but I don't really understand which is why my life looks like it look at times. Because I don't really like, I don't understand that God is everywhere. 
He's there right now. Like, he's like, I don't understand. I don't get it all. I, I, I know it in my head, but I'm not living it as if it's threaded in me. He says, listen, I need to take more space in you so that more of me resides in you. And when more of me is in you, less of the world and the things that are naturally connected to you begin to die out. So I got to get rid of some of these ites. Now I want you to notice two things. In verse 1 he says, when, and when denotes it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. When is not if. <laughs> when is not I might. When is we on our way. Remember, Jesus said, listen, he said, let us go to the other side. The storm that rose up, hold on, we about to die. I told y'all over here, we was going over there. I don't care what happened in the middle. We going on to the other side. So he said, when the Lord your God shall bring. How we going to get there? I'm going to bring you. How we going to get there? I am going to bring you from here to there. See, that should help us not now be, oh, I'm lazy there. That should help us now be desperate for, and as Jesus showed us the picture, true humanity, I am dependent on you. But I'm still going to go and heal this man. It's the Father in me, he do the work. But I'm going to put my hand on him. Like that's Jesus. Yeah. So he said, I want you to begin to live with expectation that what I've promised will come to pass. Yeah. So he goes on and says, into the land where you go to possess it and has cast out and has cast out many nations. There's some stuff in God's way he has to get rid of. And he's going to do it. Listen to this. Because remember, when they went to fight, they actually had to pick up their weapons. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. They went in there and they had to go to war. Yeah. Now they won these wars in some miraculous ways. <laughs> it was one battle where God made the sun stay up some extra hours. Because he said, listen, these jokers are going to fall today. <laughs> and the sun kept shining and he was supposed to miss out. <laughs> there was a battle where they were surrounding this walled city and he said, this is how you going to win it. That's right. I don't need you. You ain't strong enough no way. I need you to follow my instruction because when I bring you into the land, I'm going to do this. You got to follow me. But you got to follow. He said camp out once a day, six days. Walk around the city, go sit down. I don't need you throwing rocks at their windows. I don't need you talking crazy to them. I said, walk the city and go sit down. On the seventh day, seven times, and this is what I need you to do. Shout. And the walls are going to come down. Then, run on in there and go get them. You still involved in this, but I'm working it in you. And I'm working through you, and I am working in spite of you. Because what I have declared, decreed, will come to pass. Yeah. And so God says we're going to possess this land. Uh, pick up for us in verse number two. I forgot who was reading. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. Wow. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Now you hear that. Yeah. There's some stuff competing loves. Mm -hmm. He said you got to destroy it. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yes. See, there's some stuff that I'm in, I don't want to get rid of. <laughs> but he said you got, he said don't show no mercy to it. Yeah. Now you remember we read that scripture a couple weeks ago. Judges 15, he told Saul, go in there. And I want you to kill everything living. Husband, wife, kids, cattle, donkeys, sheep. I don't want nothing standing. God said that. He says this is the picture of what it looks like when somebody is so in love with me, they don't want anything to rival that love. 
And he says, don't show that thing that you know is pulling you out of my presence. I'm telling you to come deeper and it's telling you to stay right here. He said, you got, hey, don't you see you got a fight right there? I remember, don't let them just push on you like that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't you take that. God said many of us are selling for too much stuff. Because we are not living in the reality of whose we are. We just, we, 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 we comfortable in this earth thing. We just chilling and trying to enjoy. But he said, hold on a second. I want to make you like Christ. I want you to begin to be conformed into his image. I have, in justification, declared you just like Christ. When I see him, I see you. When I see you, I see him. You guys are in union. Thank you. But now, I don't want it to just be why well, I said that about you, but you don't really look like it. We're going to start looking like what I said you are. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, kids, oh, look at the little doctor. The little doctor. I'm like, the doctor on the way. Now, we're 19 now. We need to be in school now. We need to be, I don't want to just keep saying the doctor. The doctor needs to be taking some classes. We got to be on our way by now. Some of us have been with God longer than it looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We still kids mm -hmm. when we should be like young adults mm -hmm. in the Lord right now. You know, when you get a young adult, you stop doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. There's some stuff that's like, all right, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking to my little cousin, Robbie, who loved, love uh, comic books and he would talk to me about Dragon Ball. I was like trying to figure out, you still like Dragon Ball Z? He like, yeah, yeah, I got over that though. <laughs> <laughs> he was on some new cartoons. <laughs> right? He like, that's over with. That was when I was down here. <laughs> so even the cartoon watcher knows there's some stuff that just very cool no more. <laughs> so God says we need to grow up in him. When I was in college, you know, I was on scholarship. We used to get like about 1600 I had roommates. Uh, we had, Portland was real cheap. We had for $700, three bedroom townhouse, overlooking the city. It would be like, oh, we was bald. We weren't paying no rent. It's only 700 Cats was keeping their money, doing all kind of other stuff with it. Got kicked out. That was the young lad. I ain't getting kicked out of nothing else. <laughs> I, I grew up on that. We lost, we lost that place, man. We, we was in a good spot, there were parties and everything, and we didn't pay it and got kicked out. Had the money, but see, that's what the young Larry do now. Is we, my wife, like, you don't you get us kicked out of nothing else. <laughs> we grew up. God is like, you got to start acting your Age. You know more, you know better than that. <laughs> he said, now we go back to two. When the Lord your God shall deliver them before thee, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. I just think this sounds like God says, I'm going to pull it out on front street. I'm going to give you a moment where you're going to have to go to war with it. I'm going to bring them out of hiding and put it on display. Oh, and I want wow. you to slay it. Mm -hmm. To kill it. And he said, listen to this. Utterly destroy it and make no covenant. Now, you know, cut that. He's like, don't, don't make no agreement. Don't bargain. Don't like, <clears throat> don't, don't like be like, okay. Because this is what I did with weed at first. I know God was saying, stop. I was like, okay, I'm just going to hit it once. <laughs> you know, before I was like, going in, I'm just going to hit it once, and then I'm going to back off of it. And he said, I said, stop. I didn't say manage it. I mean, I want it, I want it out of here. And so God has to take us to a place to bring it out. He said, don't make no agreement or no bargain. And listen to this. Don't show mercy to it. What, is that? what does that mean? Don't show it mercy. 
What do you think the implications of like bring it out? I want you to get rid of it. Don't show it no mercy. What do you, what do you what do you hear in that? Don't make no excuse. Don't make no excuse. That's part of the covenant piece as well. Don't make no agreement with it. Don't bargain with it. Just kill it. There's no no return. Nothing. You are not going to negotiate that you like you've done before. He said, "We we'll kill it. That's it." That's all. It's all. No. And when you show mercy, you're saying that yeah, maybe it's something worth keeping. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not treating it like it really. Right. You know, it'll be okay. <laughs> but it won't be okay because it's going to multiply again. It's going to be some. So if you kill it, you're done with it. So pull up the roots. Yes. Yes. I'll just pull off the leaves, <laughs> branches. Because you know it's going to grow back. I want you to pull the roots up. And, and burn the root so you can't plant it nowhere else. Like that's that's something he is calling us to engage in, and he wants the motivator for that to be love. I go back to the image I've used often, which is Holly Berry said, love should have brought you home last night. Which meant love should have welled up in you so tough in that moment of temptation that the love caused you to be like, I'm out of here. Just spin off. Mm -hmm. That's what Joseph said. Mm -hmm. The lady yeah, come to the like, hey, <laughs> anybody around? Like, hey. <laughs> and I'm sure if she's the queen of the house, uh -huh. she jewelry up and beauty <laughs> up and perfumed it. And he said these words. <clears throat> How can I do this thing and sin Listen, not against your husband, though I do respect him, but sin against God. And I just believe the beauty of that was that he had been in turmoil. Almost could make it feel like God has forgot all the dreams he talked about. It ain't ever like I should be through with God. But he's like, even though I'm where I don't really want to be or don't even understand what's going on with my life, I still know. God has been good to me. And I do know he watching me right now even though your husband ain't. Mm -hmm. Love made him, listen to this, that boy spent up out of there, she was holding on to his coat. And it might have been a coat he wanted to keep. He said, man, you can have that coat. I'm out of here. Love brought him out of there. I have loved you okay. with an everlasting love. You were stuck. Oh, yes. But my love didn't keep me on the throne. Woo. Love said, come oh, off the throne. Oh, Step into humanity. Woo. Take yourself I down there oh. and hang up on the cross Amen. and give yourself to show Amen. how much you love it. Love should have brought me home last night. Yeah. So I need you then, God, to help me love you. Help me see you in a way that overcomes all of the rival loves, that your love is so compelling, your love is so drawing me into your presence, that it gives me power yeah, yeah. to kill what I really want to keep. Do you feel the weight of that tension? I want to keep this. God said, that's keeping you from me. Help me recognize that. So that that's the argument going on in my head. Not the argument on how I keep it, but the argument of how I get more of God's love. How I get, like, I want more of Him. If I want. When you want something, oh. ain't nobody finna stop. Okay. <laughs> when, you, when you want it. That's true. <laughs> I done went to nations that got pie, two in the morning. My wife, like, what you doing? I'm like, we're gonna get some. Go back, I'll be back. <laughs> the want to had kicked in. Yeah. And ain't nothing stopping the want to. Somebody said this, where there is a will, there's a way. way. I'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> Your will is 
happened was <laughs> no. Come by. 
See, that's special love. Yes. That God would reveal to us the way of salvation. He says, notice something. I did not, the first seven, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. You weren't the strongest or the biggest nation. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn unto your fathers, has the Lord brought you out, of, out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of uh, Bodmin from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, which keep covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and will repay them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to them that hateth him. He will repay them to their face. Now I want you to notice something. We all hated God. Now I don't want you to play nice like as if you always loved God. I'm talking about God in his true essence. Like the God of our imagination. Like we all loved him. Like I remember it was stuff I did you just get me out of this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Situation getting fixed. I go right back. I go right just like I couldn't love him. I like thanked him, but I went back to doing it. I didn't love him. And so we all hated him. Remember the scripture we read before um, Luke, I believe it was uh, 19, where it talked about uh, he went into a place to command himself uh, a kingdom, to set himself up a kingdom, and he called people to himself. And it says that the citizens of that land hated him and said, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's where all of us, by nature, live. We wanted to be our own God, yep. determining our own future, our own way of living. We didn't want nobody impending on how we was going to run our lives. And just think about it, like the, how natural of an instinct that is. <clears throat> when I'm in my car sometime, and like, you know, my wife or my kids, they get to turn in my knobs. <laughs> it, it's something that rocks. <laughs> <It's, laughs> yeah. Like, what you doing? Like, it's just like, it's just automatic. Like, I'm not, without even thinking about it, it's like, don't touch the heater, don't touch the music, don't touch nothing. Like, it's automatic. Like, you don't want somebody controlling what you feel belongs to you. And so, by nature, we all hated God. But for some way or some way, we came to love God. Thank you. Yeah. Not because we just loved him. He worked against and in spite of our hate of him to do us good. Yeah. Like this is one of those moments where somebody does something in your life that you're frustrated with at that moment and they say to you, but you're going to thank me later. Uh -huh. That they're in your face confronting you about something and just being like, no, nah, you're like, but you'll thank me for this later. That's what God had to do. He had to fight against our will to bring us to the place where we were looking for but didn't know it was only found in him. I was looking for joy, peace, happiness, rest, comfort, status, some being something. He said, oh, that's over here with me. You chasing everything but me. You looking for me in all of the wrong places. And it wasn't until I begin to taste oh, this in, and see that those places begin now to be an enemy. Oh, I ain't, I ain't, I'm through with that. But see, what has to happen is more tasting, more seeing will help me now look and compare. See, when all I have is this, uh, this is all I need. I'm going to make do with this. But when there's something that rivals what I thought would be the thing, and now I'm being attracted, I'm being drawn, enticed away into the things that God really wants. So that's what has to happen is I need to spend more time with him. Many of us don't spend time with him. Many of us don't get in the word. Many of us don't like... One of the things that helps me, I'm a preacher. 
one of the things that helps me is I don't always look at the Bible to preach a message. Mm -hmm. I look at the Bible because I need to have the Bible correct me, like talk to me. I know I gotta go talk to some people, but I need God to talk to me. I listen to other preachers yeah, yeah, yeah. so I can hear God's word confronting me. Like, because I'm a sinner. Like, I need the Lord to overcome stuff in me. I got competing agendas against the Lord. I need to be confronted with the gospel. And so what we have to do is, like, we have to fight to make space for the Lord. It's like having a, a, a room that I want to, you know, when you got company coming over, not family company, because family company is like, just come on over, it's good, I ain't cleaning up nothing, it's just come on over. <laughs> when you got company coming over, you get to tidy it, you prepare space, you make a plan, you setting it up. God said, well, hold on, I'm about to come through. <laughs> get ready. Don't just get ready. Don't just lay down and it's like, oh, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> no, man, make some arrangement, like, set up some space so when I get there, me and you can hang out. Yeah, right. I ain't coming over here to watch you watch TV. <laughs> I don't want to see the housewives. Just, I don't want to see this week. Can we, can, we, can we watch something else? I got some stories up in here, man, that's like, can we watch something else, though? Right. And so he has to take us on. So let's look at something. I'm, I'm a... All right, so go to uh, just turn that sheet over. Let me um uh... Yes, the parachute jump. This one, this half sheet, if you turn that over on the back, I want to start at number six. Number seven, the distinguishing grace of God. Turn to Exodus chapter 11. You got about 15 minutes. Exodus chapter 11. must come to pass. So then turn back for a second. Hold your place. But um, go to Genesis 15. And let's just see how exacting God is. Like everything has a purpose. There's no full way stuff with God. Like he is always at work. <clears throat> so here we find in Genesis 15 verse 13 that God is co uh, making covenant with with Abram, he's making covenant with him. He's promising him about the seed. So Genesis 15, verse 13 says, And God said to Abram, I want you to know for sure that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve 
will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Do you see that? Yep. So God promised, now think about this, this is some hundreds of years before the children of Israel became a nation. Because remember, Abram was the one God called, and he couldn't have kids. God promised you will have a kid, and that kid will become a nation. Yeah, yeah. He's going to have kids. So this is some time that went past that, mm -hmm. where Israel now was, they was nobody then, but a promise. Mm -hmm. They was a nation of millions later on. Mm -hmm. God said, listen, and they're going to be slaves for 400 years. That's, hold on, you see what God is doing? He's like, I don't care about the, the stuff I take you through. Because listen, I have loved you okay. with an everlasting love. My love cannot be necessarily seen by what you go through. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. if you walk by what you see, you <laughs> will think, I don't love you. Because yeah. if you love me, why is this happening to me? But God, I like, know it's not about what happens to you. Because if what happens to you is about really helping you be, like Jesus showed you to be, more dependent upon God. And if it takes 400 years to bring you to be dependent on me, 400 years it's going to be. Good Lord. <laughs> See, that's a real God. I'm going to get glory. No matter how long it takes. Yeah. And listen, he said, I'm going to bring them out of slavery, and they gonna, when they come out, they're going to come out with great substance. Mm -hmm. So now let's go back to Exodus, which is why he said, I'm ready to fulfill my promise. Go ask your neighbors, let me have that gold and silver you got <laughs> on, your, on your dresser. <laughs> I know that was a tough conversation. <laughs> Let me have that watch. Let me have the earrings. Let me have that necklace. I saw you last week with that, that watch. Let me get that watch you had. Because God's like, you ain't going to need that no more. So Exodus 11. Let's get back there. Okay. And so he says in verse 3 now. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Listen, he made the Egyptians willing to give it up. He's like, okay, are you going to have to do anything else? Wow. Because God made a promise. Yeah, yeah. When I bring you out of here, you coming all the way out. And listen to this. You ain't going to need nothing when you go. You're going to be fully supplied. Mm -hmm. He said, and the Lord gave uh, people great favor in the sight of Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus said the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. So let me ask a question first of all. Who is killing these kids? God. Say that again. God. 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 God won't kill nobody. He loves everybody. Did you see? He just said, I'm killing some folks. Remember he said, I, those who hate me, I'll show them something. Aren't you so glad yeah. that God is working to make you love him? Yeah. Because if he decided to be against us, how you going to fight him off? How you going to stop him? Because he does whatever he pleases. He say everything belongs to me. This is why the proclamation has to let God be God, let grace be grace, so that when I stand in his presence, I know I am here not because of anything I did. If you were based on something I did, I would not be here. You did everything. Yes. Yes. Salvation, as the psalmist said, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in my eye. Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. I rebelled my way into the belly of this way. If I'm going to get out of here, he got to do it. I was in a pit and I cried out and the Lord heard my cry. Yes, I couldn't get out of the pit. All I could yes. do was cry. Yes. Why was he listening to me? There's other people who cry. Right. But the Bible said, but he inclined his ear. Yes. See, the pit was supposed to produce the cry. Yes. 
Watch out. That's a real cry right there. Watch he really crying out because he know without me it's hopeless. <laughs> See, God want to get us there because he know when you're desperate, you want me there. So I want to make you want me there. If that's what it takes, if slavery is what it takes for 400 years for you to cry out, slavery is going to be. Because I'm going, you going to love me. You going to, I am love worthy, says God. And I'm going to give you, listen, reasons. So remember we said when we started this series, God said I want everything to result in the praise of my glorious grace. You will be thanking me for all of eternity for yeah. what grace has accomplished. Yeah. Somebody said it like this, except for the grace of God. <laughs> one, of the, one of the writers said, if it had not been for the Lord, for the Lord who was on my side, where? I know, still in sin, still in bondage, still in slavery. Well, look at what he says he's going to do. He said, And all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sit up on the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the mill, and all of the firstborn of the beast. God said, can't nothing hide from me when I come. If you're not in Christ, remember that's what Noah's Ark was about. I don't care what your confession is when I come in judgment. If you're not in the place that saves you, I'm getting you. That's, that's, if you ain't on base, <laughs> you out. You better be on that base. I don't care how close to the base you is. I don't care if you got your hands right. If you ain't on that base and I tag you, you out. If God comes and confronts us apart from Christ, oh my. But in Christ, listen, the Bible says in Adam we all have fallen. But in Christ, fallen people stand. Yeah, yeah. I'm standing up, able to behold the glory of God. The glory that should consume me and blind me and crush me. I'm able to behold the beauty of God in the person and work of Christ. He says this, and there shall be a great cry throughout all of the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall there be like it anymore. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So the Lord has people. To you it is given to know. To them, they'll never understand. They got eyes, but they can't see. They got ears, but they can't hear. But hold on a second. What makes you different? You, you should be deaf, dark, dumb, and blind, too. Back over there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I have loved Woo! you. Oh, do you hear specifics on Yeah, that? come on. You. Barbara. <laughs> see, to That's you versus to them. Yeah. There's a you and a them. God says, I've loved you forever. So he says, I made it. I just want you to hear the image of that. Because he says, listen, we finna walk out of here. Mm -hmm. Over a million people finna walk out of a land somewhere else. And he said, when y'all walking, even the dogs in the front yard won't bark on y'all way out. He said, nothing is gonna be able to protest this deliverance. Mm -hmm. Do you know how tough that is for yeah. you to walk down a dark street? with dogs in the front yard for dogs not to be barking. Yes, right. they go crazy. God said, I'm going to shut everything down. Wow. I want you to know there is nobody, nobody going to be able to oppose mm. what I have planned for you. Mm. God is like, like he is like the true, like that's just, that's boss. That's, that's right. right. 
Yeah. That's just like, nigga, that's, 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 right. that's like, I'm the superhero. This movie is all about me. I got the, I'm the only one who has a right mm -hmm. to floss. I'm the only one who got a right to listen to this. Pop a collar. He like, you, you better wow. not pop your collar. Because you, you ain't done nothing. And you, you, you pop that collar if you want to. God said, I'm the only collar popper around here. I'm doing this. He said, I'm going to put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. They going to die, but you going to live. They're going to be destroyed, but you're going to be saved. But look at this. Let me just stop for a second. So this conversation was God bringing to an end the back and forth he allowed to go on with Pharaoh. Because remember, the Bible talked about the God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God told Moses before he ever sent him, listen, Go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go so they can come worship me. Let me just stop right there. Do you see the purpose of freedom? Yeah. Worship. Yeah. Lord. Go, go tell them to let my people go so they can come and worship me. Not come and have this and want that and drive this, live over there, travel in this vacation, eat that kind of food. Like That ain't my focus. You might drive. You might wear, you might live, you might go. But the focus of your deliverance, me. I am your exceeding great reward, says God. I don't give you just rewards. He said, I want you to want me. I want you to want what I can give you. Anybody a chase dude would have would have signed me up. If you would give me that, God like, I'm not that God. That ain't me. Which is why he said, I'll wait you out. 400 years of trouble to help you just want me. <laughs> Lord, I just want you. Lord, whatever. I don't care what happened after this. I just, I'm tired of this. I can't take this no more. And so, I want you to see right quick the process, sanctification, God takes his people through to bring about complete deliverance. It's on these scriptures that are down at the bottom. <clears throat> Turn to Hebrews chapter 7, verse, well, I'm going to just quote that. Go Exodus 8. I'm going to quote Hebrews, and let me get my phone, my uh, tablet battery going out. So, we go on. Exodus chapter 8. We're about to wrap up here. Exodus chapter 8. Verse 25. Now Hebrews 7 talked about this. <clears throat> and he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him. Speaking of Christ, he says, I completely save. I don't partially save. I don't like start and leave it up to you to finish. I like when I save you, like you're going to be what I want you to be. Even if I got to fight you, you're going to be what I want you to be. You got to hear that about God. Oh, I think. He ain't finna just let us do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been wounded by the Spirit of God and mm -hmm. brought under conviction to where, listen to this. <clears throat> I remember it was a moment in my journey. I was, I was just doing what I wanted to do. I, I got navigator. I'm pastor. I'm, I got all of the stuff where I should be happy right now. I'm traveling, I got CDs, my name getting called everywhere. But I was wounded on the inside because God like, you know I want you to do better than that. I got all the trimmings that I couldn't, I, I'm riding and that was, I, I, I'm, this thing don't even feel good right now. Because I am out of place with God. He disrupted joy. To bring me to like, I don't want to navigate, I don't, I don't want to. But God has to bring about a conviction to where I don't want the stuff. I want you. To where I was, like I told you earlier, I was in London looking at these guys who was just loving the Lord. And I was like, I want that back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. It was just about Jesus. 
Wasn't about no name, no reputation, no none of that. Nothing would I get out of the deal. Jesus and him alone was making me happy. And God let my soul get lean enough to want the real back. And then sent me on a journey to get it back. And then say, thank you, Jesus. That's like, it was like one of those uh, hot summer days. No soda, just water with the good, 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 good. good. <laughs> That's what I need. Mean. And so he is able to say to the uttermost those who come to God by him. So Exodus chapter 8, verse 25, verse 27, listen to this. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egypt before their eyes, and um, and will they not stone us? Will we go three? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as He shall command us. So stop for a second. God said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can come and worship me, which means they got to leave Egypt and go where I prescribe for them to go. I want them to worship me missing there. I don't want them to worship me in Egypt. So God said, I'm calling you out of the world and deeper into Christ. I want you to worship me over there. But listen to what Pharaoh tried to bargain. All right, y'all can worship, but worship right here. He said, man, we can't worship our God in the face of these gods because we finna fight in here. He said, we can't do it. Pharaoh said, look, 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 this is what Pharaoh said in 28. And Pharaoh said, I will, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far. Entreat for me, or maybe, basically, basically go ask the Lord that. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarm of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people to tomorrow, but let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore, and not letting the people go to sacrifice uh, to the Lord. And so, and Moses went out from the Lord, and entreated, uh, out from Pharaoh, treated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, and from his servants, and from his people, and there remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, Neither would he let the people go. Now you know this is all on purpose. God says every God that they have, I'm going to come into conflict with. So that they will know I am God and my people who've been kind of now dipping into that worship. Since they've been waiting so long, they're worshiping these other competing loves. I'm going to let them know it wasn't real in the first place. And... Pharaoh said, you can go, but you can't go all the way. Just don't go that far. <clears throat> now look right quick at Exodus 10. Exodus 10, verse 7. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God, Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Like, man, God is tearing our place to pieces. Let these people go so we can stop <laughs> after them coming confident. And look what it said, verse 8. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be, with, uh, be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go, um, go now ye that are men, and serve the Lord for that ye desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So he said, listen, all of the men can go. But leave the kids, leave the camels. Because listen, you can, I don't want you to go too far. You can go worship, but you got to come back. Because your kids, your cattle, your livestock. Listen to this. The enemy wants us to bargain. Remember he talked about them ites. Don't make no agreements. I want it destroyed. When you come out, I want you completely out. 
Pharaoh is trying to say, all right, just admit. He's like, listen, my family's got to come too. When I come up out of here, everybody's going to worship the Lord. We all for the follow the Lord. Now let's get this last one. Um, look at verse 16 of chapter 10. 16 says, The Pharaoh called by Moses and Aaron and Hazel and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray you, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and treated the Lord, and the Lord turned the mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. And there remained not one locust in all of the coasts of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even the darkness may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose from any place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds stay. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, uh, we must give sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There should not be a hoof be left behind. Uh, for therefore we must take to, uh, take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And then as we know, in verse 11, or chapter 11, he said, go get the silver to go, get your kids, get everybody ready, everything leaving. So God works through a process of elimination to bring us so that we come completely out of the bondage we once lived in. That's sanctification. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by Him. Though you are not yet what you will be, the Lord will oversee the work and then call us to engage in this work so that we begin to not be made right with God. We begin to desire to be made right with God. Then we begin to follow the instructions that God gives to wage war with the things that are impeding our progress. Those ites get killed. Before I wanted to compromise and settle and work, make arrangements. I'm going to do Jesus on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm going to do the others on the Wednesday. And the, I, I'm on all seven days. I want everything you got. I want it pointed towards me, says God. The goal of deliverance from sin is worship. It's worship. It's to be brought to an overwhelmingly dis, um, disposition that everything I need, everything that I actually need to be brought to desire is in Him. And to not be satisfied until I get more. It's a hunger and a thirst. <clears throat> Look at what the psalmist said. He said, <clears throat> there's one thing that I desire and that I will seek after. I don't want to, listen to this word, dwell. In the house, which means presence of the Lord forever. We talked before about that statement that says, better is one day in yes. your courts than a thousand elsewhere. With them doing that, having all that, ooh, that looked like fun. For a thousand days, but better it's one day mm. in your courts. And the fact, like God, I need you to work that in. Because these thousand days, with all of them and all of that, look way more exciting at times than one day mm. in your presence. Lord, right there is where we need help. Right there is where we, we need the Holy 
Spirit to awaken and activate us that the competing loves pale in comparison to your love for us and your love for us that when seen clearly works in us a great and a deep love towards you. Yes. Father, we need you to continue to be at work in us, to, um, to carve out more space, to help us prepare for the moments when you bring those ites out that we might have the courage, the strength, the posture, the attitude to say, I'm done with this. Would you bring that to place? Because we recognize that without you, mm. I'll do both. Mm. I'll have you in my head. I'll have days where I enjoy you, but it'll be moments where I just go on and slip off into my own stuff. Father, that's not what you are calling for me to live. It's not the way you want my life to go, this, this dualism. There are some things in my life that you are you're moving to get rid of that. There's some other stuff that's still going to need to be getting rid of, but there's some stuff now you're coming after. Yes. Say, man, I'm ready to bring an end to this one. Yes. We're we going to go to the next village, but I'm coming to that village first. Yes. And I want all of that destroyed. I don't want no mercy shown to that. Can't keep it alive. Yes. It must die. So that we might live. That Christ might live in us. That that joy that is unrivaled might rise to a higher place. The killing of those things brings about the life of better things. So stuff got to die. So that Christ and all he is can live in us. Oh, help us, Jesus. Help us. Help us, help us, help us, help us, help us. By your spirit, God, move, quicken, sharpen, intensify. Help us pick up our pace. Help us begin to yes. act our age yes. in you. Yes. So that we might give you the praise. We might be brought to a deeper level of worship. As we see the things that we didn't want to get rid of and couldn't get rid of. That you give us an attitude demolish and overcome and the tasting of more of you sweetens and overcomes the loss of whatever it is we got to overcome for you are good help us to taste and see that it's in Jesus name
Lift up your voice and ask for the increase of God in your life. The increase of God in your city. 